has a very large rheumatology practice in Del Mar and uh, is very knowledgeable on ankylosing spondylitis as well as all the other rheumatic diseases. So, Dr. Chicken. Thanks. It's my pleasure to talk about the topic. And so, uh, in general, we'll talk about not a mainstream, but kind of an outside view of how spondylitis can be treated, uh, what are the triggers in the development and progression of spondylitis. And uh, again, I didn't know much about how educated you are, guys, and so it may be a little technical. So, so don't worry about that. So ask me questions if you feel like you understand something. So just feel free to smoke me, and so we can discuss as we go. And then we'll have a discussion at the end. So we'll talk about uh, the gut, the box, and spondylitis. So this is a topic which uh, comes uh, up in my practice all the time. I have more and more patients who don't want to deal with biologics, who want to find an alternative view. And so we'll talk about how to do it in our clinic, and we'll talk about science and some other things. So first of all, uh, I want to remind you that spondylitis is a disease which is a part of a much larger group which we call spondylar properties. And there are several well-defined entities under this group. So obviously it's ankylosing spondylitis, and the second large entity is so-called undifferentiated spondylar property of the spondylar arthritis. And this is the largest group. The majority of patients who come to me in my practice, they do have undifferentiated spondylar arthritis. Uh, we have arthritis streams are known as right of disease. It's uh, definitely the entity which is treated by infection. So we have arthritis. Uh, spondylitis associated with uh, colitis or Crohn's disease, and finally juvenile onset spondylitis. And there are several other you know, entities which I didn't put here, like SAPA syndrome and PAPA syndrome. And uh, so, uh, in general, this list can be continued and continued. So, what do we know about gut and spondylitis? Uh, from a morphological standpoint, meaning if we do the biopsy, if we go and swap you, approximately 65 to 70 percent of patients with spondylitis have changes in the gut. So, and typically on a morphological basis, we can define two entities. One is acute inflammation, and second is chronic inflammation. So, the acute type typically uh, presents in more kind of a robust way, uh, patients have much more symptoms, and uh, in general we see it in patients with support reactive arthritis or right of disease. So, and again, if we do histology, it's almost indistinguishable from acute enterocolitis due to various infections. Again, uh, that's something which we typically see in patients with reactive arthritis, and uh, this particular morphological picture can be seen for years and years and years. It doesn't disappear. Uh, in patients with uh, spondylitis and in patients with uh, undifferentiated, undifferentiated spondyl properties, typically we see findings which very similar to Crohn's disease. It's not typically Crohn's disease, but again, if you do the biopsy and if you don't underline history, most of the pathology reports which you get said, so, well, it sounds very suspicious of Crohn's disease. And again, a good kind of definition of uh, exact changes, but again, histologically and on gross morphology, they look very, very similar to Crohn's disease. Again, if you just uh, focus on ankylosing spondylitis, uh, these changes can be seen at least in half of the patient with spondylitis. And quite often what happens, we have patients with so-called Crohn's disease, but in reality it's not Crohn's spondylitis, and the changes kind of mimic Crohn's disease. So again, it was anatomy, so what do we know about function? Uh, the main finding which has been described in numerous articles uh, is so-called leaky gut syndrome. It's an entity which is kind of mysterious for most of the physicians, but at the same time it's a very well-defined entity. Uh, most of the studies were published in the 90s, and again, uh, it's a very well-defined functional problem. So uh, leaky gut affects approximately 90 to 95 percent of all patients with spondylitis, especially those who have active disease. So in scientific term, uh, leaky gut means increased intestinal permeability. So uh, how does it work? So you have uh, right here, so this is a very simplified view. So you have epithelial lining, so you have a lining of the gut. You have cells, so-called epithelial cells, right? And so uh, these cells, uh, they work as a barrier. For example, when you eat food uh, and the food is degraded into amino acids, 
I mean, assets are actively transported through the cells right here. So when you have like calcium, vitamins, and all this stuff, all this stuff is getting transported. What about larger molecules? So the larger molecules can penetrate in your blood stream through so-called tight junction. So it's a very well-defined protein structure which works as a valve. So uh, basically it opens and closes. And so uh, if the valve doesn't work, so you end up with the gut syndrome. So, and then everything which is inside of the gut can actually penetrate in larger quantities in the bloodstream. And this includes, for example, uh, toxins, microbial antigens, food particles, uh, microbial waste, uh, various micromolecules, and so on and so on. And so what happens? So then you have typical immunization scenarios. So all these large molecules can trigger inflammatory responses. And this is not a mechanism which is unique for spondylitis. The same thing would describe for rheumatoid arthritis, it would describe for lupus, it would describe for stoidroma. So this is an entry uh, scenario, and this is the beginning of the pathological process. So over the last five years, uh, basic science made a major kind of discovery. Uh, a protein was discovered called zonulin. So zonulin is the only non-protein which regulates the process of opening of the gate and tight junction. And what's been shown that when uh, microbial cells attach to epithelial cells in your gut, uh, zonulin pathway gets activated and tight junction gets opened. Right? So that's the hallmark of the leaky gut syndrome. So why don't we see it in, uh, in normal human beings? Well, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But again, this is a key pathway uh, which uh, was described in patients with various conditions. So uh, the first disease work was described as celiac disease, which to some degree very similar to spondylitis. Uh, it was described in patients with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, and there are a couple of abstracts on ankylosing spondylitis and zonulin. So it's pretty much universal mechanism how gut responds to various uh, microorganisms and how it gets involved in disease progression. We're talking about chronic inflammatory disease and autoimmune disease. So it's a, remember, zone pathway. So as I said, most of the publications on uh, impaired intestinal permeability uh, were published in the 90s. And then, you know, the TNF era started and basically uh, over the last 10 years, maybe there are one or two publications. Zonulin kind of revitalized all this stuff, and now we can see more and more publications about permeability and zonulin, but zonulin right now is a very important target for a lot of biotech companies, and most likely in the next five or 10 years, you'll find new products targeting zonulin specifically, either new biologics or other products. So it's like a new TNF inhibitor. So uh, why... Uh, we don't have all problems with the leaky gut when our gut is normal. So what's happening, how some works. So basically when you talk about normal gut microflora, which right now called microbiota. So uh, our gut has close to 100 trillion microorganisms in the intestines. Uh, so it's 10 times greater than the number of human cells in the body. So, and some people call our gut microbiota as forgotten organ. So uh, what's the function of all these microorganisms? So first of all, uh, our gut microflora works as a major scavenger. It utilizes leftover foods. It produces a number of vitamins. It produces a number of biologically active molecules. One of the most important things is production of butyrate. So uh, butyrate is a volatile small molecule which works as an antagonist of zonulin. So if you have normal gut microflora, uh, your microorganisms produce butyrate, and butyrate shuts down uh, <coughs> zonulin pathway and it stops the leakage. So what it tells you that uh, there's a very de well-defined balance, butyrate, zonulin, if the balance is disturbed, you develop leaky gut syndrome. And then as a consequence, you may end up with various pathological consequences. 